Yes, hello, and welcome to Release the Creative, your favorite show on creativity, cognition, and on this week, part two of There's a Hole in My Funnel, Dear Liza, Dear Liza. This is our first sequel. Is it going to be uh, a massive disappointment? Probably. Uh, is, is this a sequel or a reboot? Oh, no, it's a sequel. It's a sequel. It's okay. a sequel because this is a continuation of the last one. And as with all sequels, um, it will probably lack the originality and panache of last week's. But I don't feel like last week I finished. Ex there was so we asked a lot of questions last week and we offered very little um, guidance, solutions, answers, follow throughs, you know. You know, the point, the, 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 the reason to listen. Yeah. <laughs> so let's uh, let's catch everyone up. Kind of what did we discuss last week? So last week we talked about the, uh, the what I call leaky funnel syndrome or as you uh, which sounds like a medical condition that nobody wants. Um, <laughs> you don't want that. No, nobody wants leaky funnel syndrome. And then you kind of uh, added on of calling it like a champagne, uh, like a champagne tower. Yeah. The, and, the waterfall. And, and basically it's this is that when you're talking about marketing, everyone's like, well, I have this marketing campaign and I have this marketing campaign and I have this marketing campaign and I have this marketing campaign. And a, a big problem that we did not discuss last week, but it is a real thing, is when someone advertises a problem, they're not advertising – or even if they're only advertising the solution. So, for example, I'm a plumber and I do this huge marketing campaign about do you hear creaky pipes? Do you have this problem? Do you have this problem? Do you have this problem? If you do, call this number. Right, but – all you did actually there is advertise the problem. So I go, I do have leaky pipe. I do have creaky things. I do have a poltergeist in my toilet. And so I go and I hit Google poltergeist in toilet. And now the sale goes to the person who advertised better. You advertised that I had a problem and you sold me on the problem. I am, I am shook. I have a problem. You did not advertise very adequately that I should call you. No, it says call me. Right. But you do a much better job. So yeah, Warren Buffett calls that a moat. Oh. Uh, around a, a, he he always invests in companies that he says has a have a moat, which is basically like can your competitors attack the castle easily? Right. And um, there's a lot of ways you can have a moat. I right. think his favorite was sort of branding. He right. he liked Coca Cola and Dairy Queen because Pepsi is not a Coke. It's not. And and, and that's, it's a cola. But yeah. It's not. And and if you want the the you know the specific kind of Dairy Queen ice cream. Well, you get that at Dairy Queen. You don't, right. you don't get that. If I go else. to McDonald's and I order a soft serve or a McFlurry, a McFlurry is not a blizzard. Fight me. Yeah. Like, I, and, and you could have a moat that's a patent or something. Right. But like I, I noticed he kind of went after those sort of brand recognition was his moat. But it doesn't matter what moat you pick. Right. You want some kind of moat. And I mean, and talking about, uh, you know, talking about Geico is a good example. Nowadays, whether we're talking about Liberty Mutual, Liberty Blue Chable, blah, blah, whatever we're talking about flow from progressive <laughs> or the farmers or uh, farmers or the catastrophe guy. According to YouTube, it's all. Liberty Mutual these days. That's yeah, all I yeah, see. Yeah, no, exactly. And for the record, they're doing a decent job. Not good, decent, decent job because I do smirk every time that stupid emu shows up. I, I do. <laughs> but for la for for I'm not trying to hero worship or anyone, and we're not being paid by this. But I sort of started that. Like they they invented the let's be zany, and it's for this reason. It's that they didn't want to advertise. Everyone was advertising insurance. Are you in good hands? I love Dennis Hasbro. I love his voice and stuff. Like, but he doesn't make me want to call. I'm not his audience, but like, yeah. Um, so uh, it, Geico is interesting in that you're, you're right. It was the marketing that was zany, mm -hmm. but that comes from their history. Right. Um, they started uh, the, the guy that founded Geico worked at USAA and he noticed that government drivers had less accidents. I guess, you know, they're they're just more boring people. I don't right. know. Whatever reason he said, you know, what? we're only going to insure government people. And so I want to take us out. You're the one who taught me this many, many years ago. Did you guys know that Geico is an acronym for government employee <laughs> insurance company? You didn't. And if you say you did, you're a liar. That's how it started. <laughs> government employee insurance company, Geico. But that's actually only half of it. Uh, what he did two things. He said, we're going to focus on government employees. So he moved to Washington, D.C. But the other thing is he said insurance had agents. Right. They were like franchises. You would go see your insurance and agent. He on and he said, we're going to do it by mail. He said, we're going to have a little office. We're going to have like six employees instead of hundreds of employees around the country. We're going to have six employees and you're going to write us a letter and we're going to send you back your policy. And it's all through mail. And that was a radical. This was in the 1930s and, yeah, and radical, that, radical shift. And then in the 50s, they're like, oh, we could do phone. And then in the 90s, like, oh, we could do Internet. So they kind of kept growing. And now it's like, oh, well, everyone has a Web page and everyone has a call center. Right. But but for insurance anyway, Geico was the one that was like, we don't need a guy in an office and then, right. well, we don't need a, a mailbox. We need a phone. And so 
by the time they got to the wacky advertising that we're familiar with, which was when they gave up on the government employees, they're right. like, we need we need more people. Uh, that wacky advertising kind of came from them looking at things differently f- since, from the beginning since the 30s. So but and that's incremental innovation. We talk about that. Actually, that exact story uh, is is what inspired was one of the things that inspired my book. But we'll talk about that another time. So we started talking about these these moats and these funnels because a lot of people make this big problem and they go out and they advertise the problem or they even advertise a solution. Did you know that a re, uh, did you know that refinancing your home could save thousands? Call. I stopped listening. I'm going to Google who I should call to refinance. Yeah, that's bad. You need to do something that you're the solution. You're the and so what a lot of people do is they build these leaky funnels. They they and one of the ones that I've noticed that do it the the worst is tattoo parlors is because they're advertising aren't tattoos cool? Like wouldn't you wouldn't you love to make your body a canvas? Isn't this awesome form of expression? Don't you want this? Thing? And they look at this person. I did I did baby feet. I did eyeliner. I did whatever. And what they're doing is they're advertising how cool that thing is. There's no reason to call them to do it so and they and they they rightfully are proud of bragging about look at the artistry oh, of our absolutely employee. but but here's the thing i've noticed every tattoo artist is amazing <laughs> i mean I mean, so the tattoo artists yeah. listening no right there are certainly bad tattoo artists but those aren't the ones on pinterest and instagram those aren't the yeah, ones we if, see if you're bragging about being a tattoo artist you're pretty this, you're, this is just a tangent here but i always have a uh, a problem with there's like compilation videos of like best uh, soccer player or best basketball player. Yeah. And like, I can't tell the difference. It's like, <laughs> look at them score all those goals. It's like, yeah, so did the other guy. Like yeah. they, they're all amazing. Yeah. And it's kind of at some point it's like, wow, you're all great. Yeah, exactly. So like I don't watch football, but man, I will watch a two hour highlight reel. Like I will watch two straight hours of the catch or the impossible <laughs> thing or like, man, but I just am not interested in digging through for that moment. Anyway, my point is. We have these things and we're going to we're going to keep on talking about tattoo parlors, but it it's plumbers. It's it's everyone. They're really great at advertising the solution or the product, but they're not always wonderful at explaining why they are the person to go to. So much so that when I was designing uh, the tattoo, I'm, I have three tattoos planned um, and I've had and people are like, oh, you're just stacking them on. I've had three tattoos planned for five years. Uh, they're the exact same three. I've just been working on finding the artist and working on the art and I've had reasons to to not get them. But I'm, I'm finally pulling the trigger. I'm going in late April to get my first. But I found there are companies that you can go on, you can collaborate with an artist who could be anywhere in the world. You can go back and forth with them. They will send you high res files that you can take to any old tattoo parlor and they'll just slap it on you. At that point, it's, it's. So you're saying somebody will custom design it for you and give you the blueprint. Basically. Exactly. They'll, they'll send you the stencil and then you just find any tattoo parlor at your local strip mall who can color inside the lines and you go pay them the hundred dollars an hour, $200 an hour, $300 an hour to, to put it on. So Geico sending tattoos through the mail now is, that what? <laughs> is, is, is more or less. I mean, one step shy of sending you the tattoo gun. That would be a terrible idea. Don't do that. Um, the trick to these funnels is, is what Geico did with being zany in the nineties and now has started an, an entire trend that is the, now the standard. There are very few insurance com- com- the Dennis Hasbrids are you in good hands are the vast minority of insurance company. Yeah, we now. just said you two that you said the emu and the other one is the people being goofy in front of the statue of Liberty. Right. Uh, you know, and, and, and Liberty, Liberty. Oh, my gosh. That one speaks to me because <laughs> Jeff has cut together my blooper reels and he's like at Liberty Mutual. I'm like, shut up, man. This hurts to watch. Not because it's hard, like. I have an entire demo reel of like, like of me. But yeah, somebody talking seriously about insurance would feel weird now. <laughs> right. And again, other than Dennis Hasbro has been big, like grandfathered into that. Um, other than that. No, if someone came forward and like even the most straight faced one is the we are farmers with JJ uh, with J J uh, J Jonah, Jonah Jameson. And if you don't know, get that. I'm sorry. I'm sure he has a real name and other wonderful roles, but he will always be J Jonah Jameson to me. Um, and those are the sh- most straight faced and they're zany. They're not. Yeah, they're not flow, but they're still a little bit off the wall. Um, what they've what these people are trying to do is they're trying to make you want to deal with with them as opposed to, Hey, we have insurance and it is good. Uh, instead of we're going to chase the price down or we're going to chase the service. They're trying to change it to a personality value. And that is a very, very real thing because at some point I can design a tattoo myself 
in Illustrator, print it out, take it to a tattoo artist and say, I want this. And I've removed the need for their personality. But I don't want to do that. They don't want me to do that. Sure, there's a guy out there who's not very creative, but can certainly color and he wants me to do that. But these tattoo parlors, what they need to do is start capitalizing on their personality. The first tattoo artist I ever, ever came uh, came across that I was like, I love his work, was Justin Nordine. He's in Southern Colorado, Grand Junction, Colorado, if I believe. Um, and I loved his work. But very quickly, he has a year-long waiting list. Everyone loves his art. And very quick, I was like, I, I liked his art. His art's amazing. But it wasn't going to be, it wasn't my story. It wasn't the story I was trying to tell. And it's what turned me on to finding that's not just the style I wanted, which I do like his style, but the artist I wanted and the shop I wanted and the story I wanted because it was, because that was important. So it, it's interesting, um, you know, just to recap last week, we did the whole circle of life on the internet right. where um, this tattoo parlor that you're going to go to um, just in case you didn't do listen. Do they call them parlors? You know, right. that that's what I call them, but um, we maybe, might be old time. We might be old people on the that, internet. That might be like a 20th century thing. I don't know. Okay, um, continue. Sorry. Anyway, uh, just to, to recap from last week is that there's this tattoo parlor in Utah and they post signs every day, like a real sign, like in their lobby. Like a marquee. And, yeah. and they what they put it on Instagram, right? Right. And somebody saw it on Instagram, put it on Reddit. I saw it on Reddit. I I messaged it to you. Mm -hmm. You made a TikTok video about it. Right. Somebody showed the TikTok video to them. They put on Instagram, hey, have Kirk call us. Right. And then so there was like this huge big circle right which and, they then took back up to tiktok to tell me to call them right yeah and so now now you're in touch with this place and you're gonna you're gonna fly to utah to get a tattoo because somebody right shared and then i shared and etc cetera, etc cetera, down the line and this whole convoluted story actually made me think um it was kind of funny 20 ish years ago my wife got her first tattoo in college i remember and she did it for an art project uh it was she was she was in an art class at George Mason University sure. and they had to do some kind of final project that was uh, something to do with art being meaningful to you and personal to you. Right. And, and so she got a, a tattoo and she, I videotaped it for her and she edited it together until like the story. Um, and so, and I was just remembering all of that. It's kind of this thing where uh, you're going to fly to Utah because mm -hmm. you have this personal story now. Right. And uh, I don't know exactly how she picked the place she went, but it became personal because she, we made this video and it right. was, we were still dating and I made this video of her and that's a section of um, the of town now that's been kind of partially torn down and rebuilt and there's like the place it used to be is torn down but the little building next to it is still there and whenever I drive by there I'm like oh that's the building next to the one where the you know so and, the, the actual shop is gone now yeah it, it was like one of those was like three old houses had been turned into businesses uh, oh, gotcha. and then they built like a big municipal building and like the one house on the end survived, but the other two didn't. Right. Yeah. So now you see the little house and it's like, oh yeah, that, that doorstep there is where it used to be a gravel parking lot where we parked that day. Um, and so anyway, now, now, even though it's not my tattoo, I have this memory of it. Right. Um, but, uh, so anyway, the whole point is between you and her, I am realizing that like having a story about your tattoo is kind of important <laughs> to some people. I, I, I also am talking to some people right now um, on TikTok who who they love the artist and they love their body as a canvas. So for them, it's trust and artistry. And they walk in, they sit down and they say they throw their money on the barrel head and said, go crazy. Yeah. And I am so jealous of that mentality. I could not do it. I'm far <laughs> too. I'm far too crazy for that. But like chef's choice. But but here's the thing, though, that is part of their story is that their body is is becoming that part of the narrative. Now, I don't want to get caught up for those people who are like, well, I don't like tattoos. I don't want to. The whole concept here isn't tattoos. The whole concept here is about making sure you're talking and making sure your audience knows that you're talking to them. Yeah, that person that, like you just said, that's different from you. From the business's perspective, those are very different people. People you're talking to. Yeah, no, like, and and that's where people get mixed up on what an audience versus a key public is. And that's not what today's podcast is, but I, what I want to, I want to cover it really fast is that an audience, let's say I'm, I'm an airline. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm Westwood Air. That should be a thing. I'm Westwood Air. And it'd be really easy to say, well, my, my, uh, my business is people who need to get places. Okay. That's true. And I have a seat. I have a set number of seats to sell. I have a set price for that seat. And that's all that matters to me. As a true capitalist, I have 100 seats to sell. I have 100 flights a day. That's it. But that's not enough from an audience perspective. 
I have so many choices. I need to know you're the airline that caters to me. You're like, what do you mean, Kirk? They all are basically the same. They all give you stupid peanuts. They all give you a, uh, well, not anymore. They give you a stupid snack and a drink and, and they get you there. Right. But the mentality of a person flying to a funeral is different than the mentality of a person who's on his fifth flight this week mm -hmm. is different from the, the father who's packing up his entire family to go to Disney world for the first time to get his, you know, to get this big first exodus. Even though they are all using the same device, they are all using the same mode of transportation. They're all using the same service. The mentality of that person, the, the language of that person is not the same. And to make, so those are key publics, vacation travelers, bereavement. Not, not the people, the scenarios. The scenarios. Okay. Exactly. A business traveler is going to look for best mileage, best upgrade, best miles and, and rewards, best upgrades, uh, you know, platinum. A ability to change yeah. at the last minute. Yeah, platinum yeah. double plus, no cancellations, blah, 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 blah. The family traveler is going to look for the the easiest mode of the easiest with children, the nicest the X, the best and most accommodating Y, whereas the business traveler probably wants the airline with the least number of families going to Disney World yeah. like that. <laughs> in many even though they're both on a plane, those two audiences do not like each other. Um, so audience airline travelers, key publics is the mentality of that of that group, more or less. It's the psychographic and a little bit more of a. Uh, you know, and that's uh, like a real basic example of that is most restaurants have a dinner menu and a lunch menu. Right. It's the same food. It's the same food. But, it's packaged. It's a little different. But if yeah. you're if you're coming in for lunch uh, and you're near an office park, you don't want a long, slow dinner. You want to fast, fast something. I love that example. So because that's going to get me to where I was going in a different way. So you and I, this has happened for the record. You and I, you know, have had jobs together over the last 25 years uh, in different in, in many different capacities. You and I go to lunch one day and we go somewhere and we get a sandwich and it was $11 and we spent 15 minutes grabbing it and going back. I was like, man, this was really great. I should bring Natalie here. And so later on a, on a evening, I go back and it's a different experience. It's because now they caught me in one funnel, but they spilt me over into another. Now it's mm -hmm. a date as opposed to a lunch and the menu's a little different. The timing's a little different. They serve a little bit. It, I'm not saying if I go to five guys in the afternoon, it's different than five guys at night. That's not their business model. But the places that have lunch menus versus dinner menus, it is. Yeah. It's a different experience. Even as much as Ruby Tuesdays or Chili's, their lunch power hour is different than their, their evening happy hour. Just is. This is literally every human being. And a lot of people try to say that it isn't. But talking to your dad in front of your mom is not the same as talking to your dad on a fishing boat. Not that I've ever been on a fishing boat with my father. <laughs> it's never happened. Not once. Well, then you really don't know. Do you? Then I really don't know. But you get my point. Like if you go into your dad and you say, hey, dad, I need to talk to you. And your mom looks up from the table. I'm not saying that you have secrets from your mom, but that is going to be a different conversation than driving home or, you know, having a dad talk. It's a different psychographic. It's a different mentality. If you hit your audience at a different point on their journey, in many cognitive ways, they are a different person. They have very similar interests. They have very similar needs. But from a communication and cognition standpoint, they are a different audience. Just like that exact same traveler who flies five days a week, uh, flies five days a week for, um, for business, might not pick the same airline when he's traveling with his 10 kids to Disney World. So some of these things are, I mean, the... The main, the main thing here is your business may have the capacity to support more types of customers than, than you thought. Um, and vice versa. You might be attempting to support audiences you don't want to be supporting. Yeah. Or the your attempt, if you have a, that airline, you have 100 seats and you're trying to fill them with anyone with a pay, anyone with money. By do If you're trying to be everything to everyone, you'll be nothing to nobody. If you were to just say, hey, look, I'm sorry, we just don't Virgin Airlines, Virgin Cruise Lines. <laughs> They launched their first trip, their first ship last March. I'm so sad for them, <laughs> but their big thing that they advertised for the year and a half that they were getting ready to launch their first cruise, Virgin Cruise Lines is no one under the age of 18, period. No, this is not a family cruise. This is not, you, there's going to be a club. There's going to be debauchery. There's going to be drinking. And then you have the Disney cruise line at the other end who, Which, who uh, yeah. if you are over the age of six going on the Disney cruise line, you're allowed, but you need to know, you know what you're getting into. Right. I mean, like 
And and I am absolutely positive that there have been honeymooners that went on a Disney cruise for their honeymoon. Oh, yeah, there's plenty of people that love that atmosphere and they love theme parks as adults, but you understand that you're getting a very different experience. Absolutely. And the thing is that someone could build a $42 billion yacht and say, what? We'll have nightclub. We'll have the daycare on this side and the nightclub on this side and the nude pool on this side and the kids pool on this side. We can do it. We have 3,200 cabins, 6,400 place, uh, capacity for blah, blah, blah. The people that want the nightclub and the nude pool do not want to be on the same boat as the people that want the, the daycare and the kids pool. Yeah. So this goes to almost everything. There's very, very few businesses. I mean, just so much as when you talk about plumbing and HVAC, you're like plumbing and HVAC, it's the same machines, right? Commercial and residential, they aren't the same people. Mm -hmm. They're not the same techs. They're not the same. They Could they do it? Sure. Is plumbing plumbing? I guess. I don't know what I'm talking about anymore. I'm not a plumber nor an HVAC person, but knowing who you service and why and specializing and people go, yeah, that's why you have to niche. That's not even what I mean. I, I think that marketing people over hit the niche. I mean, Gary V said it really, really well. I hate that I quote Gary V as often as I do. I really do. I'm sorry, Mr. V. I'm sorry. I wish I didn't quote you as much, but you know, the cool thing about Gary V is, is he was asked once I saw this video. Uh, he was asked once, he's like, how is it that everything you say just a applies to everyone. Like, how is that? And he goes, cause I don't speak to demographics. I speak to psychographics. I speak to the way you think. And if you, if, if that's the way you think you can be black, white, old, young, male, female, you, you can be binary and non-binary. You can be anyone. But when I was in, in marketing and, and communication school, they were like, you know, define your audience. What's their age? How much do they make? What's their, this, what's their, this, what's their, this. And those are good tools to help you figure out psychographic. But at the same time, if I told you, 45 year old man in Tyson's Virginia. I just, I mean, I guess I, I sort of described by saying Tyson's, I gave it a, a, a very broad socio demographic. That guy could make anywhere from 50 to $500,000 a year. Mm -hmm. That person could drive anything from a Prius to a Bentley. Literally. Yeah. I'm thinking about, you remember in high school, I was in a extracurricular Star Trek club. Yes. And when you say who joins a Star Trek club, if you were casting that for a movie, right. you would cast Justin Long like in Galaxy Quest. And in that movie, that's what they did. They had a bunch of teenage nerdy boys. Right. And uh, and then you might say, oh, well, there might be some sort of like computer programmer, older guys. Right. You know, but like you stereotypically, you kind of think you're thinking a certain way. And I'll tell you that this Star Trek club I was in, there was the, the nerdy kids. Right. And I was one of them. There was the sort of IT tech enthusiast guys. Aged man yeah um and that what i just described was half of it the other half was middle-aged moms there was just a lot of women that you know uh were yeah. raising kids and their kids watched star trek and they watched it with them and sure. they just got into it yeah and uh, like that's not something you would cast in a movie and and or if you're a marketing person and you were like oh i need the i need the star trek fan it's a well it's a 13 year old boy that says you know it's like well then you'd miss out on half i went to a lot of conventions right there was a lot of middle-aged moms at these conventions and the same exact thing so i used to be in a motorcycle club if you know what that if you understand motorcycle clubs i was in a i was in a traditional three-piece motorcycle club if you don't know what that means it doesn't matter and if you do there you go um and people used to find out that i was in a traditional motorcycle club and they're like you don't seem like a biker and i was like what does a biker look like like, cause absolutely, I will absolutely tell you that in my club that I had the mechanic that wore like, like wore nothing but black leather and wore a bandana all the time and stuff like that. I also had GS 15s, which if you're not in the government space, that's like an army colonel or a military colonel. Um, I had GS 15s. I had, uh, CEOs of, of, of fairly major organizations and groups. I had people that were making like upwards of six and almost seven figures a year in this club. We had people that were insanely, insanely, uh, not bikers. We'd go to the rallies and we all looked similar and we weren't all middle-aged white guys. I'm only barely middle-aged now. And the club was a while ago. I was, and I was the guy that I would pull up to a red light and everyone's like listening to their Leonard Skinner and their ACDC and all that. They're like, yeah, yeah. It was a, it was a traditional club, which is to say we were on cruisers. It wasn't sport bikes. Um, and they're like, Westwood. They didn't call me that. And they're like, what are you listening to? And I was like, the Matilda soundtrack. <laughs> and they're like, what the is wrong with you? I'm like so much. You don't have the time. But there was also people that were listening to like easy listening and jazz. There were people listening to audiobooks. There were people like 
a biker is just as much a trope that people think they understand that they don't as a Star Trek fan. And so if you're aiming at, if you train, if you aim your persona is what we say in marketing, mm -hmm. if you, if you aim your persona at, well, I need Star Trek club guys, a 13 year old boy, blah, blah, blah. You miss out. But if you look at the psychographic of who likes Star Trek and why they like Star Trek, now you can be talking to a, a middle-aged mom and a 13 year old boy at the same time. Right. Because they feel identified psychographically, not demographically, uh, which is why a few years ago, Harley figured this out and they stopped talking about, they stopped talking to men and they started talking about freedom, life on the road. They started talking about the wind in your hair, weather, the outdoors. They started talking about, <laughs> they started talking about experience and writing and the joy of the road because now you can be talking to a 13 year old boy and a 65 year old woman in the same phrase, because I'm now talking to wants and desires. So back to the tattoo shop that we started with at the beginning. Yeah. It'd be really easy to say, hey, my, I have a tattoo gun and a chair. I put tattoos on anybody who wants tattoos. And that's great. You certainly can do that. But there's the people like me that I didn't, I really, really want the tattoo to be perfect, but I didn't want to just design it online with someone in another country or, or somewhere and, and have it ma emailed to me and printed out and, and colored on by someone else. That wasn't the story that I wanted. I wanted to have an experience with an artist at, and, and a, a tactile thing. I wanted the story to matter because the story of the tattoo matters a lot to me. So I wanted the tattoo, the, the tattoo, the story of the tattoo matters. So I wanted this, ta this story of getting the tattoo, right? to, 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 uh, matter as well. There are those that just want the experience. There's, there's saying people that have tattoos describes the same bulk of people as people who ride on planes or people mm -hmm. who have motorcycles or people who like Star Trek. You've got to start talking to a psychographic, not a demographic, a demographic people with that, like, you know, middle-aged men. But, but if you start talking to people who see the world in a certain way, you stop these leaky funnels. You now, or you catch people as they fall out. It's now you're catching people not, you're now catching people not who wanted a tattoo because that's not hard to find. You're now catching people who want to be a part of your story and want you to be a part of theirs. When you start talking about motorcycles, about the experience of riding, you stop just getting someone who wants to be on two wheels and you start uh, get finding people that want to be on your two wheels. When you start talking about Star Trek correctly, you start, you stop talking to people who like sci-fi and start talking to people who want to be a part of this culture. If you stop thinking demographically and stop thinking about who wants your product or service and who can pay for it, but start thinking about the mentality of the person who you want to be working with, you now only get your audience and now you only get the people you're, you, you, that want to work with you. Mm -hmm. And I will say on LinkedIn, my banner, uh, my banner was a black lives matter, uh, a rainbow black lives matter. It was about, all about inclusion. It was, it was rainbow and black lives matter. And a, a few months before the election, it was September or mm -hmm. October. Um, I had someone come on. I have the, I can see who saw my profile. And so I went and I, I sent someone a message like, Hey, I saw you were looking at my profile. I'd love to connect. I'm really impressed with your background. And they came back and they said, Hey, no, thank you. I saw that you support black lives matter and you know, the, 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 the pride flag. And uh, those are things that I just really stand against. So I, I, I don't want to be doing business with you. And I thought to myself, Oh, thank God. Like self-selecting. Oh my gosh. Never have I been happier to have been flying a rainbow black lives matter flag than that. Now I don't have to find out that I don't want to work with that tool. Like I don't, I flew my flag and it eliminated the people that I don't want to work with. Mm -hmm. It's all about the psychographics and that's how you fix the leaky funnels is you stop talking about what you have to offer insurance and you start talking about who you want to offer it to. Not in an exclusionary way, but in a, in a rallying your people sort of way. So how do you, if you're, running a business uh -huh. and you have hired someone to, you know, take a picture of your product and throw it in the newspaper and put this week, nine ninety nine, And that's what you do. Right. And you're like, all right, this sounds interesting. Like what, what am I, you know, it's like, wh where do I start? <laughs> cool. 
<sighs> How much time do you have? So the, the uh, four minutes. <laughs> the quickest way to say is uh, I use I use an amalgamation of a lot of different things, and so I can't. A lot of them are other processes that I don't have ownership of, and I don't want to. I don't want to advocate for things that I don't agree with or do agree with that I don't use all of. But I break people down into one of th three categories. Does your audience think? Do they feel or do they laugh? And I understand that like you can think and feel and laugh. I, are you when they're interacting with you? When, you know, like <laughs> what's, like what's are you want to, when someone's on the internet? When someone's are they there to look at cat videos? That's a laugher. Are they there to look at infographics and watch uh, minute documentaries like Nas Daily? Love Nas. That's a thinker. Or are you want to, are are you people? Do you like people that were moved by the Sarah McLaughlin video of the crying puppies? which I don't know anyone that was moved by that. Most people were just offended, but like that's a feeler. Um, and it's, if you have something, so let's talk plumbing. It's just straight plumbing. Take everything else. Yeah. Is your audience the one who doesn't want a broken pipe to utterly destroy their basement? That's a feeler. Like you show flooded basements, you show like, Hey, get winterize your pipes. Don't know how to winterize. Call us free consultation, free blah, 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 blah. Yep. You know, that is a feeling. Thinking, did you know that you could be wasting $1,000 a month <laughs> oh my gosh, on your water bill? <laughs> you know, you could be using, losing pennies a, uh, pennies a day, nickels a day. You could be losing all this money. But, you know, that right there, that's that's thinking. That's analytics. That's numbers. Or uh, I once traveled. I was driving around Corvallis, Oregon, and I saw a septic t company and a big septic tank uh, truck. And it said, we are number one in a number two business. And I'm like, if I owned a home with a septic tank, I and lived in Corvallis, <laughs> I would call these people because that's freaking hysterical. And you could say, well, any plumber, they have clients across all those. And p companies like Red Bull, I can show you the three campaigns where they were talking to their thinkers, their feelers, and their laughers. You can absolutely talk to all three of them. You yeah. just can't do it at the same time. Pick, pick one for now. <laughs> and then... You can absolutely have a client base that does all three. You just can't talk to them all at the same time mm -hmm. because then none of them know that you're talking to them. Um, and so the first thing you'd want to do is, is you pick your developmental outcome. Developmental outcome, D-O. What do you want to do? Developmental outcome. I want to make them laugh. Cool. You have a goal now. You now know what you know your subject. Your subject is you. Now you need to want to develop one of them. You want to, to laugh. Second, no, I want them to think. I want the, I really want to get them thinking. Cool. Developmental outcome. Give them something that you want them to think about and make them think about it. Cool. Feel. Developmental outcome. I want them to feel a certain way. Cool. Developmental outcome. Mm -hmm. What do you, and now you have your first step. So now that we're to the next Okay, now you have them feeling, thinking, or laughing. Next, developmental outcome. Now that they're feeling, what do you want them to do? Developmental outcome. Okay, no, I want them to buy this product. Think about, I want them to uh, write me an email. I want them to call today. And once you just keep nesting these developmental outcomes, nest these uh, DO, um, I want them to think, I want them to feel, I want them to laugh. I want them to call, I want them to write, I want them to, to <laughs> buy by breaking these steps down by individual audiences and individual outcomes, we can move. Uh, it's like curling. It's like the most, like the never say die world of Canadian curling. It, you know, you don't just, it's not bowling. You don't just throw it and see what happens. You push it and then you guide it. Yeah. You don't, you don't touch it past that point cause you kind of can't, but you, you push it down the ice and you, you, the guys, you have the sweepers on the one side and, and you, you guide it to where you're going with these small steps of wondering who you're talking to and what do you want them to do? And you do that about 12 times. Who, what, how, what, when, what, why, what, and, and you can push it all the way down there on the ice. And that's how you move a generation. I like that's some good practical advice to end on. It's, that's like the most baby of baby steps to get you going, but yeah. that's the direction you want to be headed in. Absolutely. So uh, that's it for the show today. We will see you all next week. Thanks. Thanks for joining us here at Release the Creative. Kirk here would never say it to your face, but he thinks you should like and subscribe to us on YouTube. And Jeff is far too shy to admit it, but he thinks you should subscribe to us on your favorite podcast reader. Yeah? Well, you're the one who's always saying that everyone should give us five stars on Apple Podcasts. Why do you have to make everything so difficult?